Dr. Jordan Peterson, I've just had the pleasure and interest of watching one of your inestimable talks. It's the first time I've um, seen anything you had to offer. I was um, attracted to the title uh, concerning the Ukraine war uh, overlapping American Civil War. And um, wanted to thank you, first of all, for respecting my intelligence. You approached the topic and you approached me as an unknown listener um, with a great deal of candor and respect for the potential to be understood. And I don't always see that. I look forward to viewing more of your um, revoir. I did detect some fallacies and gaps I wanted to bring up so that you could perhaps um, address them or improve your work. I know that it might be a defect in my understanding. I'm deaf and my attention can stray when I'm confused by an intelligent man's points. But I kept to the text as it appeared on my screen. It seemed accurately translated. Um, I have to read what you say. I'm deaf. I use the closed caption function. And um, I find myself um, enjoying an opportunity to make imaginary speeches to people of your caliber. I know that you probably won't watch this, and somebody who comes across it might wonder, who am I talking to? I'm talking to Dr. Jordan Peterson on the understanding that he probably will never pay any attention to it. That's why I didn't um, include this link on my brief commentary mentioning that I was going to make this tape. Um, you know, I once heard John Stockwell of the CIA give a speech, and I had a long written response to it that never, I mean, it just got thrown away at some point in the course of never being read to anybody. But I enjoyed reading over it to see what my views were on the subjects that he raised. Now, one of the things that I found sort of flawed in what you had to say was the idea that, um, we have no real interest other than um, economic interest in the Ukraine. If I understood that correctly, um, that we didn't care about them. But the hypothetical potential for having humanitarian interest doesn't necessarily mean any economic or material gain in the matter. We just simply want to see um, a stop put to unnecessary suffering. And you could argue that some sense of humanitarian interest in the Ukraine um, forages ahead among people who want to understand the Russian side, that we might intercept unnecessary suffering to them. Overall, your defense of Russia and Putin's character was tasteful. I think that anybody who has seen Mr. Putin talk understands his intelligence is, um, and his popularity. But all of us are um, uneasy about what has happened. And I do agree with you, however, Although you didn't mention the possibility, is all I'm saying, of humanitarian interest that was detached. I am in sympathy with you that there's probably not such a humanitarian interest that most of the decision makers in NATO's high command see the death of children as something we can exploit for propaganda value, meaning a plus in our benefit. It's not a humanitarian consideration. We're appalled and revolted, therefore we should boost our efforts to bring about more deaths of children through resistance to Russia's 
insistence that they be allowed to make territorial gains in Donbass. I have my own view of the situation. I've heard it um, alleged that it's unheroic not to stand up to the Russians. But to be very truthful, I don't think that unheroism is uh, absent in the refusal to negotiate. I think we're dealing with a situation where we should um, storm the classroom with demands for negotiations. We should be doing everything we can to reassure the Russians that we want to resolve this peacefully and immediately and that we're willing to make concessions. And I don't think that it's foolish. But um, the point is, is that the humanitarian aspect would have to not be lost on us. And I don't think that saying that we oppose the murder of children when we're not willing to negotiate is particularly consistent. So another thing that I, you know, was borderline skeptical about, but at the same thing have to approve um, concerning your uh, the ideas that you put forward, not necessarily entirely the content of your ideas. I want to criticize the content of a few of your ideas. Another one um, doesn't pertain to humanitarian intervention. It comes to pertains to the idea of moral absolutes that if you say A is not A, you are somehow automatically deranged. I don't believe that. And I can give you an example that you would, knowing your intelligence, agree with me about. You, 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 there might be some way that you can answer to show that what you're saying is both true and that what I'm saying is true, which you will agree without A being not A, because I'm contradicting you. And that would be the example of Leonardo da Vinci's color theory. Everybody knows that he created masterpieces, and these were based on his color theory. But we also know that the strict understanding of scientific nature of the color spectrum was best worked out by Johannes Itten. He understood that red was a primary color, which was the opposite of green, which was the secondary color. Leonardo had a different sense, a different flavor of what opposites were. He didn't go by the scientific wavelengths of opposites and secondaries and tertiaries. Instead, what he did was had a, sense, a sixth sense about what he considered to be the most complementary, the most um, frictive of the color senses. So it then followed the script of science, but it was still true. But they're a little bit different. The color theories are a little bit different. So in a sense, there are things that are matters of taste that don't make you deranged. They just make you different in your selection of color, for example. Now, I was spellbound by the mysticism of the image that you conjure. I've always liked James Garfield. I found him fascinating. You know, he was he was both a large man of great purpose and a small man of middling uh, hobbies. A beautiful human being, well-rounded. And I imagine you saying, you know, we we're talking about the Supreme Court. Imagine the stature, imagine the fulcrum of destiny, imagine the importance. And always put the best person in that position. And I imagine this person saying, yeah, actually existing, and saying, please, as magnanimously as he could, please consider this woman who is black. And I thought of the Council of Elrond. Now, G. Gordon Liddy said the problem with people like me is that we live in a fantasy world. You know, and the, this fantasy world means not like 
fogging people's offices and doing things that Tico and Letty thought were non-fantasy. People like me live in a fantasy world, because so, I like Tolkien. But Tolkien at the Council of Elrond was faced with two hobbits who were insisting to join the fellowship. And he said, come as those who are willing. It's true. Elrond wanted, Gandalf said, come those who are willing. Elrond wanted powerful elves who could hold off the nine in a crunch. And Gandalf said, we must take the sincerity as the, as, as the basis of the caliber um, in no uncertain terms. Well, you seem to be moving into a position of defending deception. Why did they come right out and say, we want a black woman? Why didn't they beat around the bush about it? Why didn't they say, we're looking for the most qualified and then put forward the black woman they wanted? Well, it was because they felt the time had come to own up that black women have been disenfranchised, that she's qualified. She deserves a chance. And she's willing. She's part of the fellowship of the society that we are building together. I think you should take that very seriously. Your choice was the choice of a wise person, a magnanimous, very wise person. It may have even been that somebody more qualified than her, the man who you imagine, or woman who you imagine, as being of the species of mysticism and errant, sent to capture the day, said, give her a chance. Okay, now, when it comes to um, the issues of um, migration and um, solipsism, I don't really understand that well, but I admire your command of language and assume that you used it properly. I think your speech was brilliant to the point and very respectful of me. I, I admire that, that you could be respectful of me with having such high-minded thought. was very deeply appreciated by me as your imaginary viewer. But what I want to say is that when you talk about the orthodoxy, for example, of the Russian people and the decadence of America and saying that there's an overlap with America's civil strife. I think I both want to distance myself from that and also because I don't want America to be impinged on me as a civil war issue. But I also want to make sure that it's accurately defined because I know that it does. I know you're right about that. And I've been waiting for somebody else to come along who's brave enough and willing enough and forthright enough to face that fact about what has been being happening. And I think you left some things out. I think you left out, for example, that the orthodoxy also exists in the Ukraine and also exists in the United States. To some extent, you represent that orthodoxy. And this orthodoxy is something that I am familiar with. They diabolicized me, they mistreated me, and they attempted to run my face into the ground and make me out to be a rat who they had cornered. So I know that their experimentation in the realm of diabolicism is real. And I think that those people who conjure these things because they think that they're part of this mysterious crowd from the fourth dimension and the orthodoxy that led to Kharkiv and Moscow's Wispansky is part of their um, guru fellowship in a leapfrog oligarchy that transcends national boundaries. And as you say, therefore, Ukraine becomes a civil strife issue in the United States. And I grant you that there's probably some truth to the fact that people need to be more versed in what it means to make a moral choice and more successfully encouraged to think of things in terms of moral choices. I believe that too. But I also know that the forces that conspicuously and deliberately degrade us can be militarily intended to bring about causing an example that people can point at. 
then you say, let's not be that way about Vladimir Putin. Let's not be childish about Vladimir Putin. I happen to agree with you. Now, there's other issues that have come up in, uh, pertaining to the ecology of the Green Party. The Green Party, I know, are hooligans when it comes to um, the masses of people. They really don't like it, and they think about overpopulation. I investigated them for atrocities and personal things that they did to me that were extremely cruel. But we do have an environmental crisis. And we have to minimize our dependency on fossil fuels. That's true. That's not wild, gender-confused, left-wing radicals. That's a fact of truth the leaders of the United Nations, the Pope, the Africans who are suffering from terrible drought, all of Massachusetts is suffering from a terrible drought. It's spread from the West Coast. It's going to spread going. We're losing the earth much more quickly to climate change than anybody has been willing to admit. Okay, that's a moral dilemma, and we need to face reality about that. Now, when it comes to the issue of taste, sitting face to face in the same room as somebody. A little bit of um, recapitulation of what I consider to be a fallacy in your idea of ASA. Um, clean is not clean. Okay, a person, I wouldn't want to be in your presence because I tend to wear, you know, baseball stuff, you know. And my paintings are paintings that are based on faith. When I mix paint, I have to be careful. I know that paints can contain toxins. I have to be careful. I've tried not to choose paints that have toxins, and I dispose of them carefully. But I have a problem um, with my gums. It makes me shy to smile. I'm an old person. I wouldn't want to be a, 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 an old junker in the presence of a fine, respectable, and well-to-do person like yourself. I find Zoom meetings much easier because of my presentability. I have a, a, a stomach ailment that was visited upon me. I have to take some methicones to keep my stomach from rumbling. It's a problem when I go into public transportation. Now, in your line of thinking, that makes me a bad person. Why, do, why am I a bad person? I'm not impinging on you in this way. I keep, you know, there's, I, when I went into the Japanese bookstore, which I, it's well known, I, widely, I really admire the Japanese aesthetic mystique. I saw this book, and you, for you, I'm like you in some ways. I mean, I saw it as like a radical gender confused moment, you know. It was showed an elephant's rear around. It was a children's book, and it says, everybody poops. He <laughs> he. Well, for me, you know, I keep my poop to myself. I didn't want to see that book, you know. I consider myself clean cut. I don't go out of my way to impinge on other people my ACLU format when I have to um, use the um, conference station. You know, that, and, and so as a result of that, I'm very shy. I speak out of turn because I'm deaf. I don't like to impose my presence on people, because one of the things that um, I, I find attractive about um, intellectual activity is that, um, you know, I'm a little bit excitable when it comes to points of interest. I mean, I was, despite the um, heavy mood that you're addressing, I was overjoyed to find somebody who was respectful, respectable intriguing, engaging, and at some points, questionable. You know, and so I engaged it. I watched it from the beginning down. So, you know, but I think that there's some things that, um, you know, points that need to be um, carefully addressed that you put forward in sort of a, a format that seemed to be, be fallacies and gaps. Not to say that I... In questioning your character, I'm sure you're more than capable of engaging the points that I have raised. I'm just bringing them to your attention because they seem to me to be truisms. 
that there are times when A is not A, and yet it's still true. As in Leonardo da Vinci's sense of color opposites. They're not Johannes scientific sense of color opposites, which have a sensibility. And Leonardo would no doubt have been interested. It would have enhanced and and, 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 and gross them, no doubt, to learn the scientific aspects that would help him understand why he saw and choose words more um, um, learnedly in explaining what he, but he, he's fascinating when it comes to the color opposites. So A sometimes is not A, and it doesn't make you deranged, it doesn't make you insane. It just means you have different tastes about some things than others do. And because your taste in clothes is so impeccable, I really have to disagree with your final remark. I think I'll keep to my room. And if you want to talk to me, you're welcome to Google Meet with me. It has CC. You can just look me up.